Let us enter into sacred time. Patrick, our music director, will lead us into worship through music. Good morning. Um, the prelude today is a, is a piece for piano entitled uh, Pacific Dogwood, which is from the, the Canadian Flower Emblem Suite by Beverly McIver, who's an indigenous pianist and composer from Ottawa. Uh, the Canadian Flower Emblem Suite is a whole series of pieces for solo piano, uh, 13 pieces, one for each provincial and territorial flower in Canada. Um, so Pacific Dogwood, from is uh, the composer's musical imagining of BC's flower and is, is also inspired by the provincial animal, in this case, the Kermode bear. Beverly McIver has this to say about her suite. I hope that this collection conveys a sense of connection to the land and allows you to envision the unique characteristics of each flower, province, and territory, wherever you may reside. Good morning, dear ones. Oh my goodness, it's so good to see your faces from home. Hello, everyone. And the faces here in the hall. Hmm. We are now in this new experiment of community worship. We are creating a newfangled, I'm calling it a multi-spatial gathering where our community this sacred community is created under our feet and between our eyes. I feel my feet. I feel the ground under my feet. I invite you to feel the ground under your feet, wherever you are. And as we look into each other's faces and see those who we know and who we care for, and those who we welcome with joy and appreciation, let us breathe into this sacred ground. I want to thank everyone who made this possible. 
As you know, there's a lot that happens behind the scenes. And I want to thank each of you who showed up here today, both here in the hall and at home. We are ready for small glitches and wee gremlins that slip into the system this morning. And so we ask for your patience and your flexibility. And we also want to hear from you how the experience has been. For those that don't know, this is our first time in this multi-spatial gathering. So I'm, I'm very pleased to be with you on this holy journey that we are on together. And it has been a week in the journey of our country, the first national day of truth and reconciliation was recognized this week, which we will honor in this hour we share. I would like to begin with the words by Richard Gilbert, we meet on holy ground. We meet on holy ground, brought into being as life encounters life, as personal histories merge into the communal story, as we take on the pride and the pain of our companions, as separate cells become community. How desperate we have needed each other and for each other. Our silent beckoning to our neighbors, our invitations to share life and death together, our welcome into the lives of those we meet and their welcome into our own. May our souls capture this treasured time. May our spirits celebrate our meeting in this time and in these spaces, for we meet on holy ground. Our chalice lighting words are from the Hindu Upanishads. We light this chalice to help us move from untruth to truth, to help us move from ignorance to wisdom, to help us move from animosity to compassion. We rededicate ourselves before this light to affirm and practice truth and wisdom and compassion today and in the days to come. Hello. We Hello. Can, you. can you hear Thank us you. now? Thank you. We've got your sound back. Thank you. The reading this morning is taken from the Canadian Unitarian Council statement of reconciliation given to the Truth, Healing and Reconciliation Commission in Edmonton in 2014. It has been read on a Sunday morning in every Unitarian Universalist church and fellowship across Canada. The preamble is currently being updated. We, the Unitarian uh, Council and the Unitarian Universalist Ministers of Canada commit to the journey of healing and reconciliation between Canadian aboriginals and non-aboriginal peoples today october 3rd 2021 we acknowledge and accept our responsibility for truth-telling healing and reconciliation to further express our understanding and commitment to change 
we offer the following acknowledgement that the principles which Unitarian Universalists affirm were transgressed in the Canadian Indian residential school system and by government legislation. Our first principle, we affirm the inherent worth and dignity of every person. This was denied when you were forced to relinquish your cultural identities and denied the nurturance of your families and communities. We affirm justice, equity, and compassion in human relations. These were violated when parents were forced to give up their children to a school system where so many children were emotionally, physically, and sexually abused. We seek to accept one another and encourage each other's spiritual growth. This was disallowed when your spiritual practices were outlawed and another religious tradition was imposed on you. We support the free and responsible search for truth and meaning. Although many children received a basic education, they were also used for manual labor, living in unsanitary conditions, leading to thousands of deaths from tuberculosis and other contagious diseases. I will add that the 215 in Kamloops are just an example of that. We promote the right of conscience and the use of the democratic process within our congregations and in society at large. The mere imposition of this school system was a clear violation of the use of any democratic process. We affirm the goal of world community with peace, liberty, and justice for all. How could this be achieved when government legislation revoked the basic rights of Aboriginal people to govern themselves? We respect the interdependent web of all existence of which we are a part. This principle is integral to Aboriginal cultures. Not only did non-Aboriginals lose an opportunity to learn from your cultures, this understanding was all but eradicated from your children's way of life by this school system. We must learn from these travesties, as well as from the strength, courage, honesty, resilience and success of those who survived the Indian residential school system.
In the midst of a world marked by tragedy and beauty, there must be those who bear witness, bear witness against unnecessary destruction and who with faith rise and lead in freedom with grace and power. There must be those who speak honestly and do not avoid seeing what must be seen or of sorrow or outrage or tenderness or wonder. This is what Unitarian Universalist the theologian Rebecca Parker writes about our purpose in the world as a religious, spiritual, ethical, committed people. I will weave her words through my reflection today. There must be those who bear witness. Seems pretty straightforward and easy to do. Bear witness, but really, and I suspect we imagine that it doesn't, we suspect not, or more people would step forward to do it. To bear witness isn't to watch a story on television, eight steps back, knowing people are actors, and the blood and the danger and the pain is just made up. Bearing witness means that we are present to the reality of another's truth, that our hearts and minds are open, and that we come with respect. It means we don't look away when it's hard to watch. As Rebecca Parker says, it means seeing what must be seen. It requires courage to be a witness, to see the sorrow, the outrage, the pain, the tenderness, the beauty, and sometimes the death. We know how powerful it is to bear witness when Floyd George died under the knee of a police officer. There were witnesses there that day. Some had the wherewithal to take out their phones and record what happened. I can't breathe was witnessed around the world. And that witnessing, that act of witnessing had power, power to change people and a history. And we pray a future. In 2014, my colleague, the Reverend Meg Roberts, described to me an experience that she had attending the Truth, Healing, and Reconciliation Commission process when it came to Vancouver. I listened, as you are doing now, to me, maybe curious, maybe apprehensive, maybe girding yourself to hear difficult stories, a witnessing once removed. Now, as you know, the purpose of the commission wasn't to write a report, although that did happen, but to listen to people's stories. For those of you who understand restorative justice, you know how important it is that each person's story is spoken in order to understand the actions that people took to understand the harm done and to make amends. You'll also know how important it is that there are people there to receive those stories. So Meg went to the truth, healing and reconciliation process and she described the circle of residential school survivors in the room, men and women who still carried in them as you and I do, the stories of our childhoods. We know how those experiences were difficult, painful, and traumatic. And we've heard of the emotional, mental, physical, sexual abuse that many experienced. What we might not know is that encircling the speakers were the witnesses. Come to honor the telling 
come to offer the power of receiving their stories. They were family members, tribal members, and those who represented the Canadian institutions who had perpetuated the harm. And what white folks like us, like Reverend Meg Roberts, who recognized the importance of their presence to be there as Canadians and as individuals who needed to hear the stories as part of their own awakening and as participator, participators in that reconciliation process. Now also moving through that room, there were the protectors, the guardians, whose purpose was to hold the integrity of the circle and to care for those who were triggered by what they heard or what they spoke. The protectors offered comfort, tissues, a warm blanket, or arms that encircled, or a walk outside to get some air for those who needed it. Everything possible was done to create a circle or a community of respect. Respect both for the speakers and for the witnesses. To speak the truth, to speak the truth of harm is very difficult because it means not only are you remembering, you're also touching on the feelings you felt at the time the harm was done. To hear truth of harm spoken is also very difficult. Because it's more than just hearing the words of somebody else. Hearing their truth usually means that we take the journey with them back to that place, back to that time, and we see what they saw, feel what they felt. And we might imagine ourselves in that same situation. We might be reminded even of similar experiences from our own lives. If our hearts are softened to receive, we will be affected. I'm sure every one of you has had an experience of hearing another person's difficult truth story. It could have been a friend of yours, a brother, a child, who shared with you their painful experience. It wouldn't take much for you to remember how it felt, I'm sure, to have heard that story. And if we were able to be truly present to them, and because we cared for them, we feel, we feel their pain. And afterwards, we might need to take some time for ourselves and go and have a wee cry or go for a walk to find comfort in the forest or in the waves of the ocean or share that experience, our experience of having heard and witnessed another's story with someone else. I think I know that you know what I'm talking about. So this is what happened in the truth, healing and reconciliation process. People told their stories of terrible things that were done to them when they were children. And in some cases had never been spoken out loud before. And they were held and encircled by witnesses. There must be those who bear witness. There is no reconciliation before truth is spoken. Truth comes first. Some truth you can whisper into your pillow at night. Some truth you can murmur into the heart of God. But when that truth you need to speak is part of a larger story, the story of a family or of a country, and if one's hope is true reconciliation, 
then the truth must be spoken and witnessed by the family. It needs to be spoken and witnessed by the country for true reconciliation, for true healing. To bear witness is a necessary and meaningful role in the process of reconciliation. And to bear witness requires courage and a religious or ethical commitment. There must be those whose grief troubles the waters. Meg described to me that after the survivors had spoken and after the tears had all taken their course, once the room had emptied, the protectors moved through the room and collected all the tissues that had absorbed all the tears that had been shed from their eyes and the hearts of those who spoke and of those who had been the witnesses. The tissues were respectfully gathered up and with respect for the courage that each had had, respect for the humanity that had been shared, the tissues were gathered up and taken to the sacred fire, that sacred fire that had burned throughout the entire week. Now a sacred fire is considered the doorway to the ancestors and to healing. Only sacred items can be placed in the fire. And when the smoke rises, it carries the pain to the creator. The tissues were placed in the fire and the smoke rose. This week, on the first National Day of Truth and Reconciliation, we are being asked to become the witness bearers. We are being asked to listen to the stories of survivors of residential schools, to those who were pulled out of their families during the 60s scoop, the stories of Indian hospitals like the one that was here in Nanaimo. We are asked to bear witness to the pain of a people and to receive their truth. There must be those who are restless for respectful and loving companionship among human beings. There must be those whose presence invites people to be themselves without fear. We are being asked to become part of this history. We are being asked to become part of this great healing. There must be those who gather with the congregation of remembrance and compassion, draw water from old wells, and walk the simple path of love of neighbor. Judy Canato, a Catholic writer, writes this, compassion changes everything. Compassion heals. Compassion mends the broken and restores what has been lost. Compassion draws together those who have been estranged or never even dreamed that they had been connected. Compassion pulls us out of ourselves and into the heart of another, placing us on holy ground, where we instinctively take off our shoes and walk in reverence. There must be communities of people who, suit, who seek to do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with their God, who call on the strength of soul force to heal, transform, and bless life. There must be religious witness. This week, or sometime soon, I invite you to go online and find and listen to the, some survivors' stories. 
bearing witness in your own personal heart to those brave enough to speak. And maybe there are stories of other people that you are called to hear, stories of survival in your own family and in your own life. We have been invited into the process of truth and reconciliation. Truth comes first, and now is the time to bear witness to that truth. Thank you for listening. Our second song this morning is um, number 1008 in the Blue Book, When Our Heart is in a Holy Place. Again, thank you to Ruth for sharing the slides with the lyrics. And again, I invite those in the hall to hum along and those at home to sing along. When our heart is in a holy place, when our heart is in a holy place, we are blessed with love and amazing grace. When our heart is in a holy place, who trust the wisdom in each of us, every color, every creed and kind, and we see our faces in each other's eyes, then our heart is in a holy place. When our heart is in a holy place, when our heart is in a holy place, we are blessed with love and amazing grace. When our heart is in a holy place, when we tell our story from deep inside and we listen with a loving mind, and we sing our voices in each other's words. When our heart is in a holy place, when our heart is in a holy place, when our heart is in a holy place, we are blessed with love and amazing grace. When our heart is in a holy place, when we share the silence of sacred space and the God of heart stirs within and we feel the power in each other's faith then our heart is in a holy place when our heart is in a holy place when our heart is in a holy place we are blessed with love and amazing grace when our heart is in a holy place. When our heart is in a holy place. Now that we're both online and in the hall, we welcome your donations and pledges in three different ways. First, we've set up the Unitarian Fellowship bank account to automatically deposit e-transfers sent to you, info at ufon.ca. Second, you can write a check and pop it in the mail. And third, if you're in the hall, there's a basket at the back of the room where you can place your donation after the service. Our charity for the months September through November is the Nanaimo Unitarian Shelter. If you would like to donate to the designated shelter <laughs> charity for the month, please um, note that on your e-transfer or your check. We're grateful for your offering. Our closing words this morning are by Stephen Kendrick. We are here to face the truth about ourselves, about this faith we love, and the way it presently serves others in the world, 
as well as to open ourselves to the ways it can be better and more joyfully reflect our potential and our core values. We want to know the ways we are bound to one another as well as to larger movements, normally beyond our sight and vision. We are gathered to learn, to unlearn, to hear, and to move forward. May it be so. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. We come now to the closing song, Carry the Flame. For folks in Zoom, we invite you to switch to gallery mode so that you can see everyone and sing along. For folks in the hall, we do ask that you stay in your seats and hum along. Carry the flame of peace and love until we meet again. Carry the flame of peace and love until we meet again. Then we shall see a world of light and a world of joy. Carry the flame of peace and love until we